Hello again, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another episode of Race in America. I'm your host, Monty Poole. From today through October 15th, we are in Hispanic Heritage Month, where we celebrate the culture. Uh, and in America, it really is hard to celebrate that culture uh, without getting into sports, because uh, Latinos have been such an influential force in pretty much every sport we play uh, in America. So uh, I had to reach out to See, who would we find to talk about these things? And I couldn't think of a better person than the man we have coming up next. He has done broadcast work for the Sharks, for the A's, for the Raiders, for the Niners. And now he's been with the Giants for about two decades doing broadcast work and a whole lot more over there in San Francisco. His name, Erwin Higueros. Erwin, thank you for joining me. No, thank you for inviting me. A pleasure to get to see you and to talk to you, Monty. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'll start here because, you know, you have a long history in sports and you've been around a lot of these players, a lot of managers, a lot of different types of athletes and athletic figures. And the first thing I want to ask you, because you've been around so long, is do you have a favorite one or two player or person that you've dealt with from the Latino culture that you look back on and go, you know what, this is a guy that I think really gets it and a guy that you really admire? Well, you know what, uh, obviously I'm going to start with the most recent one, which is uh, Johnny Cuero. You know, he's a great guy. He uh, respects everybody. He gets it. And, uh, you know, the one that I have dealt with a lot too was, was Pablo Sandoval. You know, he's another one, you know, and they're both from different cultures, different countries. One is from the Dominican, the other one from Venezuela, different uh, upbringings, uh, different education levels, but they both have been really great. So when you look back on, on your time with the Giants, I mean, you work with Tito Fuentes, I know. You've done that for many years. Um, and Tito is a former player uh, and a lot of person, a big personality guy, obviously, someone that you enjoy working with. But over the years, I mean, going back to the Giants, they've always had that culture. I mean, going back to the early days of the San Francisco Giants when you had Orlando Cepeda, Jose Pagan, and those guys. Um, what do you think it means to have that, that available, that culture in uh, that clubhouse over the years? Well, I think it just uh, is great. I mean, when you take in consideration that we are the San Francisco Giants. I mean, San Francisco is a melting pot where you will find all different cultures. I mean, uh, the Caribbean uh, from Mexico, Central America, South America. I mean, you will hear different um, dialects, different accents from all over Latin America. I mean, Spain, I mean, you name it. And the Giants have been, you know, one of those organizations that have had his uh, Hispanic players, as you mentioned from the beginning, when they moved here in, in 1958, um, you mentioned a couple, Marichal, Orlando Cepeda, my current uh, broadcast partner, uh, Tito Fuentes. I mean, you go to the current players that we have in the roster. I mean, it's great. And I think it just makes the team uh, get closer to the community. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this about your personal journey, sir. I mean, you grew up in the Bay Area and, and you, I know you went to Fremont High School in Oakland. Shout out to Oakland High Schools. Um, let me ask you this though. What, at what point did you decide you wanted to be a part of the sports media and deal with what you deal with now? Well, I mean, um, I came from Guatemala, uh, Central America in 1976. I was only 12 years old. Obviously, um, you know, lived 12 years in Guatemala. You fall in love with soccer. That's what you want to do. You want to become a professional soccer player. I came here to the United States no English whatsoever, none. Uh, luckily, uh, there were bilingual education. I attended uh, James Slick uh, Elementary School here in San Francisco. And then uh, my family and um, all of us moved over to Oakland and that's where I spent most of my, of my life. But, you know, it's, it's just a matter of uh, adapting to the culture, right? I mean, that was one of the things that my mom and my stepdad tried to do with us, which was, we're going to keep the best from the land culture, but at the same time, we're going to try and pick the best from the American culture. And a couple of things that my stepdad uh, engraved in my brain was, number one, you know, this is where you're going to live the rest of your life. So, you know, you have to make an effort and speak and learn the English language. The other thing is, 
you know, baseball is America's pastime. And, you know, uh, soccer, for as much as people are going to try, will never overtake baseball, football, and basketball. So that's where where the love started, you know, trying to adapt, trying to Americanize myself. And the only way that I could, I guess, have an easy way to do it was, number one, learning to speak English, and number two, baseball, learning football, learning a little bit, understand what basketball was about, because, you know, in Guatemala, you only play soccer. So, Erwin, where, where do you stand on, uh, and I, I speak of this because, you know, in baseball, we have these unwritten rules. You know, guys aren't supposed to do certain things when they hit a home run. You can't bat, flip your bat, you know. You, you can't really celebrate yourself while you're playing the game. And in, in basketball and football, you know, th those rules really don't apply for the most part. But Latinos have been accused of being colorful, of bringing a certain entertainment value to the game that, you know, traditionalists don't always like. Um, where do you stand on that? I mean, do you think it's okay for guys to, you know, to kind of like show their joy while they're playing the game? Well, of course. I mean, you just said it. It's a game. Right. I mean, yeah, they're making millions of dollars. It's their job is their work. But at the end of the day, it's a game. You got to have fun. I mean, just like I have fun in the broadcast booth. I mean, whether we're losing or or winning, I mean, you still have to enjoy what you're doing. And that's what a lot of these land players are doing. I mean, I just said a few minutes ago about learning the, the new culture, learning the American culture. And I always have thought to myself, OK, what about the other way around? What about the American ball player or the American culture, the American fans making an effort to understand us, to learn our culture and realize that, yeah, baseball is played over there in Latin America. Uh, soccer is played. It's well, soccer is like a religion to everybody over there. Right. But but they're having fun. If I think if we all would make an uh, a a uh, conscious effort to learn the different cultures, we would understand why the players or the land players are having fun. They're not being disrespectful to anybody. I mean, if they would just understand our upbringing, then they would understand why we're having so much fun. Yeah, you know, and, you, and we watch these things. So when, when you watch uh, players get upset about these things, uh, and to me, you know, I'm, I'm of the belief that you should be able to celebrate while you're playing the game. I mean, you see it in basketball. Stephen Curry, he does it all the time. And he, he's one of the most joyful players you've ever been around. He's very popular. You see it in football where different guys have a certain amount of color to what they do. And you, they show their personality. But in baseball, they always want to put you in a little box, it seems like. And so when you see uh, a player, whether he's Latino or not, you know, show some joy, show some uh, sort of a celebratory nature uh, and, and hit, is hit with some backlash, what goes through your mind when you see guys saying, oh, don't, that's not part of the game. Don't do that. What do you think about? Tito Fuentes, because he, he did it way before this was uh, a thing. I mean, I remember Tito telling me stories about that uh, his nickname was Hot Dog because he would wear uh, headbands outside his baseball camp. He would wear jewelry. He would wear chains. He would do a lot of different things. He had this famous bat flip, which after working with him for 17 years, just last week, he was able to show me what he did. And I was like, oh, my God, this is awesome. So I just I just think that, you know, we're going to get around it. I think it's just the new generation of baseball players are coming. I mean, we see American players now accepting the fact that, you know, you're going to celebrate a home run. And then uh, the pitcher is going to have an opportunity to celebrate a strikeout. They're going to have an opportunity to celebrate a great save, whether it's the first game of the season or it's game 162. I want to ask you this now because it, we, we, we often talk about the culture and we talk about the influence, but uh, I know I have personal favorites uh, as I've grown up as a kid, uh, basketball players, football players, baseball players that I really enjoyed and really followed and tried to emulate when I was playing. Um, but when you look back, uh, I want you to explain to people what did Roberto Clemente mean to not just baseball, but to the world? You know, Roberto Clemente is like our Jackie Robinson. You know, he um, lost his life uh, trying to help other people. I mean, he he is he is like I just said. You know, our. Jackie Robinson. I mean, if it wasn't for Jackie Robinson, obviously I wouldn't be here broadcasting, right? Because not only did he 
break the color barrier, but also open the door for someone like me to be able to broadcast a baseball game in Spanish. But then here comes Roberto Clemente that did so much for the game, did so much for his island, and like I said, you know, did so much for the other, for other people. Yeah, I mean, I you know, you look back and I recall growing up. I remember when when he passed away, and I mean, he was my favorite player as a kid, and and so I really felt that. And uh, even now, I mean, I look back and somebody asked me. I have a picture in my office uh, of Roberto Clemente uh, hanging up, just a, a mug of him, you know, where he's wearing his pirate's cap. Uh, I just thought he stood for so many of the right things. I mean, and he played a colorful game, but he's one of the greatest players the game has ever had. And, and again, like you mentioned, he passed away doing things that were beyond baseball. And I just wonder how much influence he might have had had he lived beyond, you know, being such a young player, young person when he passed away. I mean, he wasn't even 40 yet. So um, when you see that and you hear that, it's like, you know, man, oh, man, he could have been like Muhammad Ali in some ways in the sense that he had that kind of impact on people. So uh, really a big time loss for us. But let me ask you now to another, about another player who also was a cultural phenomenon because I, you know, whenever I see this guy, the, the highlight clips or the reruns or the, the, just the video of, of him uh, in his heyday, uh, it was a time. And, and that is Fernando Valenzuela. Um, what are your memories of watching him and just, you know, seeing him do his thing? Well, my memory is, um, you know, he threw a no hitter when I was working for the Oakland A's and I was broadcasting the no-hitter that they saw it through earlier in, in Toronto. And then here comes Fernando, right? He was already established, but it's like, uh, you know, it's something that I don't know if we're gonna ever gonna see again, but Fernando Mania or Fernando Mania, it was just, you know, it, it was just something unheard of. I mean, uh, his upbringing, uh, not speaking the language and needing Jaime Jarrín to be his interpreter, um, it's just unbelievable how he was able to capture all the fans in LA and mainly, you know, from Mexican descent because there had never been a player of his caliber ever before in the major leagues. Yeah, I mean, you look, and again, he, he had his own signature wind up. I mean, just all these things about him that made him, that really endeared him to not just the Latino culture, but to the American culture. I mean, he was embraced by all because he was a, an excellent pitcher, but he was also humble. At the same time, he was, he was significant and he was magnificent. So uh, it's one of those things that you look back on and go, that was a time in, in life that we'll never get back because we, don't, we want to go back and look at it, but it was so awesome to watch at the time. Uh, we're going to come back in a few minutes to talk about things beyond baseball with Mr. Erwin Higueros. <laughs> Race in America is made possible through support from Dignity Health, where every person is treated with respect, empathy, and compassion. Dignity Health. Hello, human kindness. We are back with Erwin Higueros, an award-winning broadcaster who does so much more for the San Francisco Giants right now. Uh, Erwin, let me, let me ask you this question, because this is one of those things that kind of been lingering in my mind for a little while, is that you know, we, we tend to think of Latinos in baseball because there is such a broad culture in baseball. But, you know, earlier this year, uh, Tom Flores went to the Hall of Fame. And he was the first quarterback, the first Latino quarterback to be drafted into the NFL, into pro football. And he was also the first Latino coach uh, at, the, at that level. Um, tell me a little bit about just what you know of Tom and maybe what it meant to have him get that honor. Well, I mean, what I can tell you is that my years with the Oakland Raiders, I got an opportunity to talk to him about football, to talk to him about his upbringing and, and how he is proud of his, of his heritage. Now, you know, finally he's in the Hall of Fame where he belongs. And it means a lot to, to all of us because it shows that in the different sports, uh, our heritage is being recognized and, and obviously um, being with the Raiders, being with Mr. Al Davis, who was an innovator, who did not see uh, race, gender, or anything in order to hire somebody. He basically just noticed, if you can do the job, I'm going to hire you. And, and obviously having him in the, in the Hall of Fame and being a first on everything. And he's so humble himself that you talk to him about being the first of doing this, being the first of doing that, he will quickly change the conversation and start talking about 
something else or, or wanting to find something about Yursa, which was my experience with him when I tried to talk to him about all his accolades, he would change the conversation and start talking about me. And it just says a lot about the, the person. And like I said, having him in the NFL Hall of Fame is, is just great. Yeah, Tom's a great man. And, and you know, he, he talks about his time in the, growing up in the Central Valley and, you know, how, you know, he didn't really think much of, it, of the area and didn't think much of himself, but it is where he was raised. And so to him, it'll always be home. It's where he met his wife and he went to the University of Pacific. So um, let me, now moving along from that, though, is that in football, you know, again, we don't always think of Latinos in football, but, you know, even back in the old days, uh, there were some old timers that are in the Hall of Fame, guys like Steve Van Buren, Tom Fierce, who had Latino parentage. So uh, you look now in a guy like Anthony Munoz, the former tackle for the uh, Cincinnati Bengals, who's in the Hall of Fame. Let me ask you, though, about this guy, Super Bowl winning quarterback Jim Plunkett. Why is he not in the Hall of Fame and should he be in the Hall? You know, I have no idea. I mean, I don't know what um, uh, categories or how they grade a quarterback or somebody that is eligible to go to the Hall of Fame. I mean, we see it in baseball where, you know, somebody gets overlooked. But, you know, again, here is somebody that um, his upbringing says a lot about the person. I mean, yeah, you know, when he started his career with the uh, New England Patriots, went to the 49ers, and then here he comes to the Oakland Raiders and wins two Super Bowls himself, it's beyond me why he's not in the Hall of Fame. So if you were to make a case for Jim, uh, what would you say to people who say, well, maybe he you know, doesn't have the stats or whatever? What would you tell people about Jim's impact in his career? I, I just want to say perseverance. He never gave up. He, he had his ups and downs in his career, and then uh, here comes Al Davis gives, gives him an opportunity to be a starting quarterback with the Oakland Raiders, L.A. Raiders, and and he wins two Super Bowls. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I tend to believe that he should be in the Hall of Fame. So should, so should Cliff Branch, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, you know, again, it, it doesn't always happen the way you think it should because voters vote and they don't always vote the way you think they should. Going to soccer now, uh, I, going back over the years, there's been many, many magnificent soccer players. But uh, I think still most people would say that Pele is the king of soccer, the Mr. Soccer. Um, what was his influence like for you, a kid growing up, you know, toward the end of his, his career? My goodness, growing up in Guatemala, I wanted to be number 10 because that was Pelé's number, right? Normally, number 10 is usually safe for the captain, for the best uh, forward in the team. And, uh, and Pelé was the man. Pelé is the man, especially when you look back at his career. He started at a very young age, 16, 17. I think he was already playing for the national teams. I mean, it's just uh, it's just unbelievable how just one person makes a country fall in love with soccer, and then when he comes over here to the United States and plays with the Cosmos, uh, there it goes. A reason why people starting falling in love with with soccer because they got an opportunity to see a great player towards the end of his career, but he was still playing at a high level. Yeah, when you see the players of today uh, that are playing at a high level and making a lot of money. Uh, it seems to me that so much of, the, of what they do, whether it's the showmanship or just the skill and athleticism, so many of it, you can see flashes of Pele and what they do. What are you seeing? Well, I, mean, I see a lot of people that have legs that are like the extension of their arms, that they're doing so many wonderful things, but it's the uh, unfairness of the sport. You know, here you have Pele, now you have, uh, uh, now the name escapes me. <laughs> Ronaldo, Messi, Ronaldo, Neymar, yeah. Messi, Messi, just to mention a couple that are doing wonderful things. Maybe they're better than Pelé, but for some reason for us that grew up with Pelé, you know, we only have eyes for Pelé. It's like like in baseball. You know, there's not there's not gonna be anybody like Babe Ruth, even though maybe there's players that are better than Babe Ruth. Yeah, I, I think even now you, people will say one thing that, about baseball is that I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say, oh, this guy is so much better than Willie Mays ever was. <laughs> because <laughs> Willie Mays is like, he, he'll always be that guy, you know. Um, and, and, and as long as he's around, and, and God bless him, he's still around. And, and Willie is that guy that I think will always be sort of the pinnacle. I mean, even when Henry Aaron was still alive, people looked at Willie and said, this guy was the best baseball player we've ever seen. And so uh, I think Pelé, 
uh, should have that title even as these guys come along and do what they do. I think Pelé laid the groundwork for them. So uh, now in basketball, I want to go there because, you know, it is place, it's a place where in many ways uh, Latinos are underrepresented. But uh, I, one of my favorites was Manu Ginobili, you know, and he's from Argentina. Um, I want to know how much, how closely did you watch basketball players like Manu and maybe the Gasol brothers uh, coming from Spain and those guys, how much did you watch them and, and sort of take an interest in what they were doing? You know, I, I didn't watch them that, that closely. I did follow. I was aware of, um, you know, players from Spain, from Europe coming to play. I mean, I'm aware of uh, a couple of uh, players from, from Mexico coming in. And it is a sport that uh, is dominated, obviously, by tall people. Obviously, if I wanted to, to be a basketball player, I wouldn't qualify, period, because, you know, I'm only 5'11". But then again, you know, I can't jump. I can't throw a basketball. Even if I try to throw a piece of paper in the, in the trash can, I will miss it, even if I'm three feet away from it. But, you know, it's it's great to see that the, the Latin players are coming here to the United States and trying to make a name for themselves. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you look back, and I think, again, we don't always recognize people's heritage as they are in, in their star a turn, like Carmelo Anthony, you know, his dad's Puerto Rican, uh, Rebecca Lobo, you know, her, uh, her dad is Cuban, you know, and Rebecca Lobo is one of the best basketball players, female basketball players we've ever seen, and yet people look at her and they just think, oh, she's just a girl from, that played basketball at UConn and played in the W. But Rebecca Lobo was, was an awesome player, and, and so to see those people get the kind of recognition or not get the kind of recognition that they probably deserve it's kind of a, one of those things that it, I feel, to me, it feels like a slight. And so you, you really want to see that kind of carry on. Back to baseball. And because I, I, I keep going back to baseball because the, the, the influence is so vast. Where would Major League be without, take away, without the influence and the contributions of Latino players? Oh my God, that's that's a very difficult question to answer because I, I guess I wasn't around here when there were not that many Latino players around. I just know that the contribution from our Latino players is great because they bring a different flavor to the sport. Uh, they're the definition of what uh, we are, the the reason why we are here in the United States, which is to make a name for themselves, to to have a better opportunity at life, to. Uh, to work hard to um, to um, better ourselves, you know, contribute to our families because that's what a lot of these players are doing. You know, they come over here, they work, and they have families that they need to support back home. But baseball, I want to say, would be okay if there were no Latino players. Maybe a little bit boring, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, I agree. Be- I agree. <laughs> But, you know, our Latino players, you know, they, they bring a different uh, flavor. And I'm talking about the ones that, that were born in Latin America, the ones that were raised over there, the ones that played the sport over there, because then you have the Latin American players that uh, are uh, trying to absorb the culture. And, and, you know, sometimes we also absorb the culture of playing the sport a certain way because you have an older coach that played the sport a certain way and they teach you how you're supposed to play it. And that's what you end up doing. I want to play a quick game of word association with you. I'm going to give you a name. I'll give you a name, and you tell me what comes to mind. we got about two minutes to go on the show. Pedro Martinez. Great example. (laughs) Oh, that's two words, right? (laughs) In what ways, though? (laughs) Uh, Hardworking. You know, he showed that size didn't matter in terms of uh, playing baseball. I mean, at his size not being a big man, he was able to throw the ball really hard. I got two more for you. Albert Pujols. Hall of Fame. <laughs> you know, and I don't think there'll be any question about that because he's playing at such a level. Even now, I mean, he's still hitting home runs even though the Angels gave up on him. Uh, he's still hitting home runs. He went back to St. Louis the other day and hit a home run, which delighted the crowd back there because he's such a fan favorite back there. So to see him come along and do something like that, was pretty awesome. Juan Marichal. Extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, just a great player, great pitcher, and a great human being. And I got one more for you. And, and this is one that goes back a ways because 
maybe people don't re recognize what, how good this guy was when he was playing. Rod Carew. Pioneer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? Why, why do you say that, though? Well, I mean, because uh, if I remember correctly, uh, number one, uh, his bat batting stance was uh, unique. He was not uh, into saber metrics. He was not concerned about the launch angle. He just wanted to put the ball in play. And, uh, you know, for him to do what he did, especially from being from Panama, it's, it's just amazing. That he did. Erwin Higueros, thank you for your time. Be well. Enjoy the month. Enjoy the year. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you.